Good morning and welcome to our online service for today. Why not uh, pause the recording for a moment and go and find a Bible and read for yourself today's Bible passage. It's from Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4 verses 26 to 34 and it's the parable of the mustard seed. Now since we've been in Cottenham, the rectory garden has seen something of a transformation. From a garden that was initially overgrown with trees and bushes and a lawn full of moss, to a bit of an oasis with carefully chosen plants, proper flower beds and a lawn with now more grass than moss and clover. But there remains one thing that we seem able to grow without any effort at all and that is weeds. Even though there's matting out the front to prevent weeds growing, they've burst through, demonstrated a tenacity, perseverance and strength greater than ours. In the midst of bushes, bindweed and, gr and ground ivy flourishes in our garden, inviting us to tug it out, but always leaving enough root to guarantee its survival for the following year and the next and the next. A traditional view of the parable of the mustard seed is that God's kingdom is like the mustard plant because it grows from small beginnings to something tall and majestic which offers shelter in its branches. In recent years however a growing number of scholars have begun to suggest that the parable of the mustard seed is much more radical than people have traditionally believed. In fact, various references to the mustard plant in ancient sources suggest that it might be much less welcome to those working the ground than the traditional view implies. The Roman writer Pliny the Elder wrote a natural history in which he described the mustard plant as growing wild. Once it was planted, he commented, it was impossible to get rid of because when its seeds fell, they germinated at once. In other words, while not quite a weed, it's one of those plants that you must plant with care because you'll never get rid of it. An equivalent for us may well be mint. You all know the advice, plant mint in its container, otherwise it will take over any bed in which you plant it. This changes the parable quite significantly. It begins the same. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny seed, which germinates quickly and grows to full size swiftly. Once this has happened, you will never get rid of it. Its seeds will fall constantly so that plants spring up all over the place. On one level, this is incredibly reassuring. It can often feel as though the responsibility for bringing God's kingdom on earth is entirely down to us, our efforts, our endeavours. But this interpretation of the parable reminds us that while we're called to strive as far as we can to bring God's kingdom into the places where we live, where we work, where we play, it is no tender plant that needs just the right soil, exactly the right amount of water and sun, or it will die. The kingdom seems to be more akin to mint than dahlias and dandelions than geraniums. Once established, it's exceedingly hard to destroy. On another level, however, this parable is much more challenging and suggests that the kingdom is not always welcome. If the kingdom of heaven has qualities that are like a weed, then its attraction to birds may be something that you don't want. As the gardeners among you will know, the last thing that you probably want in the middle of your nicely ordered patch is something that gives shelter to birds. Since then, they will have an easy perch from which they can swoop down and gobble up your seedlings and berries. The image here may, have, may be of a fast-growing plant that suddenly provides unexpected shelter for birds in the middle of your cornfield. If this is true, the parable is saying that the kingdom of heaven will attract to the shelter of its branches 
those whom you might not want in your nice tidy patch, those who will disrupt your gardening, and those whom you might, under other circumstances, seek to drive away. Now this is exactly what happened to parishioners in a tiny church in a deprived area of Stoke. Due to an influx of refugees, the white faces who used to make up the congregation of St Mark's Hanley had been replaced by an eclectic mix of Iranians, Iraqis, Syrians, Bangladeshis and Eritreans who were all either looking for salvation in another religion or simply seeking charity. I had the opportunity to speak to the vicar, the Reverend Sally Smith, a few years ago. And in 2016, she told me that in just three years, there had been a total transformation of St Mark's from a previously white middle-class church to something resembling a refugee processing centre. But St Mark's is far from an isolated case. Across many churches in Europe, a growing number of Muslim refugees are converting to Christianity, with some churches conducting mass baptisms. Some members of the local congregation at St Mark's were receptive, but many left, saying they felt alienated by the hundreds of new-look Christians, uncomfortable with the multicultural flags and incredulous at what they see as people taking advantage of their vicar. Over the years, Sally Smith has housed asylum seekers. She's fed them, clothed them, bought new shoes for their children and looked after their medical needs. That kindness has led many to convert to Christianity, on average three or four a week. Some do it in secret, others out of a debt of gratitude. There are those seeking spiritual relief after experiencing atrocities. In an interview by a journalist from the Guardian newspaper, Sally said this, my biggest challenge has been the attitude of some of the people within the church. I've had a lot of opposition, criticism, negative attitudes, and trying to undermine the work that we are doing. That's from the white British congregation. I've lost lots of congregation members because of what has happened at the church. They don't want the hassle, and they don't want the church being messed up. They see the church as having a very definite role, and opening the doors to refugees isn't one of them. She adds, they expected a vicar's role to be looking after the people inside the church. And one of the insults often levelled at me is, she cares more about the people outside the church than those inside. Well, my reply is, this is what I'm meant to be doing, and you're meant to be doing it with me. We should be doing this together. She is defiant, determined, but not naive. She knows that some do convert solely because they believe it'll help with their asylum application. But she says that these are few and far between, evidenced by the fact that most are still there years later. At St Mark's they receive a warm welcome and in the five years since I spoke with Sally, a whole new support service has been established called Sanctus. Sanctus meaning holy. A support service for refugees of all faiths and none. And it started from just that small seed, from a vicar just wanting to reach out to this new community that was gathering around her. Have a look online. Uh, it's so inspiring. But it's sad that... Of Sally's original congregation, just four, just four remain, with the rest deciding to worship elsewhere at other churches in Stoke, where I guess church life is much more predictable and much less diverse. But the new congregation at St Mark's, the new congregation continue to be passionate about Jesus and desperate to study and understand the Bible. Challenging and exciting are the two words that Sally uses to describe life at St Mark's. What is God's kingdom like? This parable asks, what is God's kingdom like? Challenging and exciting, I suspect, and just the tinsiest bit scary.
as we pray the Lord's Prayer and we ask for God's kingdom to come on earth, do we really know what we're praying for, what we're asking for? Are we really prepared for the disruption that the kingdom may bring? If the kingdom attracts the kind of people with whom Jesus spent his days, the outcast and the poor, beggars and sinners, then might we just regret it if God does listen to our prayer for the coming of the kingdom and answers it. I pray that we would be a church that would want to welcome all kinds of people, the kinds of people that God's kingdom will attract. But let's not be daunted by how small the start may be, but pray with confidence that God will use each and every one of us to build his kingdom here on earth, in Cottenham and Rampton. What is God's kingdom like? Challenging and exciting, and just a teensiest bit scary, but something none of us can afford not to be part of. Let's pray. When I say, Lord of heaven, could you respond with, let the kingdom grow. Let us pray to the God of heaven and earth for the growth of the kingdom. May the kingdom grow in clusters of Christians all over the world. May it grow as hearts are warmed by encounter with the living God, nourished by word and sacrament, private prayer and public worship. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. May the kingdom grow in states, empires and monarchies, in the crowded streets of cities and in the scattered rural communities, in all decision making and all spending. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. May the kingdom grow in every human shelter and home, every place of work and education, in every conversation, in our mutual care of one another. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. May the kingdom grow to bring peace and healing wherever there is pain or sadness, to bring reassurance, comfort, courage and hope to those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. May the kingdom grow as we learn how to care better for the world you created and entrusted into our care. We pray for world leaders attending the G7 summit in Cornwall, which concludes today, as they discuss economic issues, health emergencies and the climate crisis. Give them wisdom as they consider together how the world can rebuild and recover from the pandemic. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. As we thank God for all his blessings to us, we offer him the rest of our lives. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. It's been good to worship with you. Do join us again next week and I pray that you'll have a really blessed week. Go in peace to love, serve and enjoy the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>